Um, I am excited to introduce Dr. Hong Tu Ju, the professor at the University of North Carolina in biostatistics. Um, he works on many things, including uh, medical imaging and genetics and computational neuroscience. Um, some notes, were there notes that were for the Zoom audience? Oh, Zoom audience, if you have questions, you can raise your hand in Zoom and I will see it, or you can put something in the chat and I will monitor that. Um, and I think that's it. Okay. This is my microphone. Okay, the title for my talk is about the, can you hear me? And the title for my talk is about the bi-bank and scaled brain imaging genetics, clinical and the methodological advances. This is based on a joint works with all members of my lab, UNC Big S2 lab, as my former student, Bing Xin Zhao, and, uh, and Tim Fei Li, and of my colleague, Yun Li, and uh, Jason Stein, and, uh, and my collaborator, uh, Stephen Smith from Oxford. And uh, this is the main content of my talk. And the first one is methodological challenges. The second one, big data in imaging genetics. The third one is about novel clinical findings. And this is the first part, methodological challenges. And uh, this is the ABC of IoT. And uh, what is IoT? It's the Internet of Things. Basically, it's the concept of connecting any, devi any device to the internet and other connected devices. It is rapidly transforming how we do business and live our daily life. And the cloud computing is the delivery of on-demand computing services from the application to storage and the process powers, typically over the internet on a pay and go basis. It links applications, platforms, and the infrastructures. Subsequently, it generates vast amount of data. Such a data usually required uh, basically have these strong spatial and temporal structures. In real application, we usually use analytics or AI tech methods to extract the features for businesses. There are the four types of the many uh, tools like the spatial recognition, natural language processing, computer vision, and also prediction and the decisions. At the bottoms, basically, we use a lot of this reinforced learning, deep learning, apportion research, and the statistics. This is AI economic layout. Actually, the, in the last 20 years, there's a trend about industrial IoT. Basically, you should re regard it as the fourth industrial revolution and or industry 4.0. There are many successful companies like Google, Amazon, Facebook, Baidu, and other companies. And basically, they are use IOTs to digitize a specific market in order to improve the efficiency of the, the market. And this is a, uh, something related to what we are doing. One is basically the EHR, electrical health record, and the, the uh, precision medicines. The essence of these kind of things is basically we try to record, we use all kinds of devices to record the changes, all the vital psych signals of an individual from birth to death, including like a personal living habits, a medical histories and diagnosis treatment and many other records. And, uh, and uh, these days we have to deal with multimodal data. And actually, there's a four gen, uh, there's a different uh, type of this kind of multi model data. The first one is clinical and behavioral data. The second one is imaging data and also genetics and genomics, and also something related to environment, like a nutrition type of data. We also connect it. And this is a list of large scale medical data I have been dealing with uh, in my career. And uh, in the last uh, five or six years, I mainly deal with like, uh, the Human Collecting Project, ABCD Project, and the UK Biobank. And uh, 
the first of the questions we have to deal with is the data challenges. When you try to solve some of the real the problems, the first problem is the data. And actually related to medical science, the most important things, regardless of you're working on uh, what kind of data type, the most important thing you have to relate to disease, okay? You want to solve these four type of questions. One is prevention, the second one diagnosis, the third one is treatment, the last one is prognosis, okay? The year trial and precision medicine are kind of basis for this. And uh, if you think about it in the last 10 years, what is the most important breakthrough in the data science? I think the number one ish things is the create the development of image net, the data set itself, okay? Why this data set is so important? Because this data set has, in a certain way, has the ground truth. You can faithfully evaluate all kinds of the computer vision related algorithms, okay? And then it has uh, over the 15 millions of labeled high resolution images, roughly 80,000 categories, connecting from web and labeled by Amazon Mechanical Turk, okay? This is very important breakthrough in data science because you really develop something with the ground truth, okay? And this is the kind of motivates the development of the deep learning. But however, when we work on the medical science, one of the key barriers we are facing is we lack a, well, we are lack of a large number of annotated data with high quantities. If we go any areas in the field, you feel that that's one of the big barrier for us, okay? And uh, besides the uh, data challenges, you have to solve that first in a certain way. But at the same time, it's basically, it's all about the method of the challenge. Even you have a good data set, okay? The, and, but most of these data set is very challenged, okay? Have many kinds of, the, the, all the existing methods face a lot of big problems when you try to deal with this. And this motivated the second breakthrough in the data science is just the deep learning. And actually deep learning was, was proposed to, do, to, to address these three type of problems. One is the speech recognition, natural language processing and computer vision. But usually the deep learning is very good at extract the shadow information from this type of data, okay? And the other information like the method that you can develop for the prediction and decision. And you combine all these tools. One of the questions we are facing is, are these all existing tools are good enough for this kind of all the medical application we are dealing with, okay? That's very important question. Even though you have these kinds of tools from deep learning, have the tools related to deep learning, are they good enough? We don't know, okay? The current progress on this side, from the medical side, you think about it, we are trying to use deep learning to solve a lot of imaging related problems. That's true, okay? But how about your genetics? I, think, I don't think there's a lot of progress on these um, areas. And also how to integrate all these kinds of different type of data, like clinical and nutrition, all kinds of environmental data, and in order to cure the disease, okay? This site is not good enough yet because there's need, need a lot of new method of development. And also these days, uh, people are trying to think about how to integrate the data from the uh, different omics data. That's also very uh, hard topics. Many people, you know, uh, in this department, I've been working on these kinds of topics, okay? For the mass of the challenges, besides the, the data from different scales at different levels, another issue that we have to deal with is the heterogeneity. We have the heterogeneity, we have to face the heterogeneities at the subject, group, and the study levels, okay? Even you have the, the same subject, you know, if you take the same subject at the different scanners, the results could be have a lot of variation inside. Even the same, same subject, if you take the coffee, not take the coffee, you walk in the scanners, the image is quite different, in particular for functional phenomena. okay? We have to deal with all these kind of issues when you try deal with large scale data, in particular data from different uh, universities, okay? Different uh, centers. And also this is uh, basically uh, ecological, ecological layout for the, for the statistical um, uh, analysis. I personally think there are four kinds of major problems we, we have to deal with these days. 
The first one, you, you need to build a large scale data set. That's super important, okay? The good data set. The second thing is when you're in the DLVC is to deconvolution. The third type of problems is the DLV learning and also we try to deal with integration and the predictions. These five problems are super important. I have both the kinds of academia and industry experiences. Even I, I have a different team with the different problems, but actually the type of problem is same, same thing. That you have data, you need to do deconvolutions, learning, integration, and predictions. Okay, these four, pro, four five aspects are, are super important. And uh, the first one is the deconvolutions, and that basically you try to denoise the data. Okay, they increase the signal to noise ratios. And uh, this is the based on my joint work where I did it with uh, MD Anderson. And uh, actually, uh, the mass of the papers is the third papers is on the by ICAI. And I work with when he, we developed a method called the CLIP. Okay. And actually, we unfortunately applied this method to uh, two data sets published in the nature last year. Okay. And then in general, for tumors, tumor urine consists of different subpopulations, just subclone. They are characterized by the semantic mutations. The composition of the such the subpopulations may affect the cancer prognosis and the treatment efficacy. Actually, this we developed is called a, a tool also called a clip. It's a clone and subclone structure identification through the pairwise parallelization to distinguish the subclone structures. And uh, this is the project I did five years ago, okay? When I was at MD Anderson. And actually we test the clip data on 965 simulated samples generated by Broad Institute. All the data samples are generated using the copy number profiles for actual patient samples. And actually, among all these different methods, the x-axis on the right side, that's our different method. While the most of the other methods are based on non-parametric. You know, the computation non based on non-parametric is very computation intensive. Also need a, a lot of post analysis because there are a lot of outline inside. They have to manually delete and all the, many of these kinds of outlines, okay? And uh, this is the basic the, the results they published in the natural papers. The results are ICGC. Basically, we apply this method to the International Cancer uh, Genome Consortium. And uh, basically, they have connected the whole genome sequence for over 2,700 samples. The, the cloning study shows that the clone and the subclone structure composition are quite different across the different cancer types. And the second level technical questions in, we, we have been addressing is, is learning. It's basically you try, when you have, the, when you denoise the data, the next question, you try to extract the patterns in the data, okay? And uh, one project that I got involved almost 10 years ago, and it is called the baby connecting project. Basically you follow the, the babies from the two weeks until to two years. And the, the, this data is publicly public available nowadays. They have the, the all kinds of imaging data, like a diffusion structure, uh, diff, uh, MI data, and the diffusion weighted, and also function of MI data. This data set is quite noisy. Okay. Another set of methods I have been working on in these areas is related to like a diffusion weighted images. You try to map the white matter structures in the brain. Okay. And uh, this method, this areas, I have been working over 16 years, okay? We, we started from the reconstruction until basically we built the attendance for the, to map the, uh, the, the white mass structure across the subject, okay? And uh, I just show you, this is one of the paper we published in 2018. It's a well-cited paper in the field because it is the first template, type of template across the subject. And uh, this is the based on recent work did by my, my student. It's called the brain functional based structural connecting attendance, okay? And uh, you see that in these titles, we combine both functional and the structural information together. And we build this attendance. This, the whole process consists of three stages. The first one is the whole brain 
structural connections. The second stage is the creation, cre creation of fiber skeletons. The third one is a sparse representation. And I can show you these kinds of, this is a, the raw subjects for each subject at the light level side. This is all the individual uh, kinds of wide matter tracks. Each subject all have over one million of the fiber tracks in the 3D space, okay? You wanted to register all these kinds of templates and the, the, the fiber tracks to the common space. This is the common space we did, okay? And uh, this is the fiber skeleton atom, okay? These are fiber atoms. And actually we incorporate this glacier 330. There's a paper published in science, in nature, okay, six years ago. This is basically, it's a functional uh, kind of atoms, okay? And then we, this is the, took up almost one year to finish this, this project, okay? Besides that, and uh, we also do a lot of prediction, okay? And uh, this, the, I show you one, two examples. One project I did uh, in MDNS is uh, Camio, these uh, uh, challenges, okay? Uh, we are the, one of the winning teams for this challenge. What we did is quite, it took my students almost two months to do did this challenge. It's quite simple. Basically you have H and E, these kinds of standard data, okay? Sometimes you have these outliers inside, artifacts inside. And basically these kinds of images, you want to use the image to predict the current outcome. Okay, that's the problem my student did when trying to process the, this data, okay? And uh, this is another project uh, the father also did in M. Anderson, basically is a brain cancer risk predictions. You have CT scans, okay? And actually you have, your, 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 this is the uh, early, this is early detection. You have a raw data and process the data and you do pro feature detection through the predictions. You identify high risk of patients. Uh, subjects for this. And uh, today's talk is mainly about uh, integrations, okay? And it's basically the, the key things here is about how to integrate imaging and the genetics together. And uh, I have been working in this area for almost 10 years. Okay? Even though in the last three years, I have been working in the industry and I still continue to work on this. Basically, we did all these GWAS analysis of thousands of the imaging phenotypes. And with more than 50,000 of subjects from the, some public available data sets. I just show some of the clinical results from our analysis. The second part is about a big data in imaging genetics. And I have been working on this area, your imaging for almost 18 years, okay? And uh, we use the uh, brain imaging to capture the brain structures and the function changes associated with the major brain related disorders and the normal development. Here are the, uh, some of the examples like uh, major depression, bipolar, and uh, schizophrenia, autism, and all others. And uh, in particular on the right side, you have seen the uh, Osama disease. Osama disease is associated with the brain shrinkage. Okay. And why do I care about the genetics of the, the brain disorders? Actually, the most major brain disorders like uh, Osama disease are heritable complex trait and the disorder disease. It account for about together about 50 to 70% of AD risk, 75 to 80% of ADHD risk. 60% to 80%, 85% of schizophrenia risk and 80% of LSD risk, okay? That's one of the key reasons we're looking to the genetic of the brain-related disorders. But these, uh, these brain-related disorders, actually, they are complex the trait and no diseases. Actually, it's a mix of the many genes, environment factors, and complex the functional mechanisms. And the many genes contributed, like contributed to the, this kind of brain-related disease. It has a very specific, uh, very spe uh, special, uh, common pattern called the polygenic genetic architecture. Okay, that means most of the genes, the, the, the genetic effects are very small, but a non-zero contribution. Okay, and for this type of kind of the uh, the uh, the brain disorders, 
it needs a large sample size to detect weak signal. And uh, one thing I have been doing is to try to establish this kind of brain imaging genetic paradigm. Okay. I have been working for thinking these problem, pro problems for a long time. And uh, the problems we wanted to build this kind of past diagram in the sense of you start from the genes, molecules, cells, to brain and to symptoms, okay? You want to go from left to right, okay? And also you know that all these kinds of things are mixed, are confounded with this environment social and uh, psych psychological um, factors, okay? This kind of, we, we have been trying to build up these test diagrams by using all kinds of data, okay? That's the one thing, major things I have been doing in the last 10 years. I try to establish these kinds of test diagrams and try to understand it, okay? And besides working on the neural imaging data, a lot of things, um, project, major project I have been working on is try to move beyond the brain, okay? We try to, in order to understand basically the, the brain, sometimes we try to understand the complex interplay, interplay between the brain and other human organs. And then they are underlying the genetic overlaps, okay? And here's the one, one ongoing project we have been working on is basically we're trying to link to the brain Bajila, kidney, and heart together, okay? And then we try to publish a, a many disease, in particular like the micro, the vascular disease, the high blood pressure, and multi-system disorders. The possible cause, causal factors of the brain structure changes resulting in brain disorders like stroke, dementia, and cognitive impairment. And uh, when I working on these areas 10 years ago, I, I have been facing these three major problems. I have been beginning with these, these three problems. First of the things, most of your imaging data are expensive and have very little summer size, at least 10 to 20 years ago, okay? The second question I have to deal with, the genetic risks are typically dense. They have a small effect size and then need a larger sample size, okay? That's the, that's the very beginning when I analyze Adeny, there are about 1,000 kinds of the subject. I want to see a lot of genetic signals and uh, from that. Just like Kanye told me, he, he did this the same analysis for Adeny. You want to find a lot of signals in the data, right? And also besides that, when you try to integrate the data from different sites, okay, you have to deal with imaging batch effects and confounders, such as image acquisition, pre-processing procedures, and the softwares. And actually, I have been uh, doing one thing, and that's, what I, that's why I started earlier than most of the other people, okay? And uh, we try to build this big data brain imaging genetic cohort, okay? And uh, we, we systematically connect public available in individual level data from over 50,000 images, individuals, in order to build the largest database in this field, okay? This all, this I listed here about eight different studies. They both have imaging and genetic data, okay? And uh, even I, in the MD and I, I connected some of these data sources and the MD answer, okay? And I actually, I'm also trying to connect another set of data sets, only have genetic data, uh, imaging data, okay? That's about, uh, I have around uh, over the, 100,000 subjects in other data, in other database, okay? There are some two things that we have to be working on, okay? And uh, besides doing that, okay? One thing that at the, at the very, many people ask me, how do you process the data? Do you hire somebody to do it? Of course. And actually, uh, when I started my career, I used to work with, collaborate with my friends from DME or other department, basically to process the data and they process data for me. But then in the last 10 years, I have been harmonized the tools and the pipelines to consistently generate full spectrum new imaging data features by using my, by the existing uh, data set, the pipelines. The, because I have been working in this area long enough, 
I know many top people in this field, and I have the best kind of pipelines, and also I try to improve it and harmonize it. And then in general, for all these uh, data type, usually we generate three types of um, brain imaging related to the data, one, the, the features. One is the cortical and subcortical structures. The second one, second one is the wider matter microstructures. The third one is the functional neural network data features. I just give you some examples like a regional uh, brain volumes and the shape. And actually we can extract, generate regional brain volumes and the shape representations for over the 98 pre-specified brain regions and total gram matters, wide matters, and the brain volumes. And also can you try the subcortical structures and the cortical structures. And uh, besides that, we also did it for these wider matter uh, microstructures. Actually, when I did these uh, papers in science, actually we just used the uh, existing pipeline, like the five major wide matter microstructure measures uh, for 21 wide matter uh, tracks. We just use the Enigma to DTI the pipeline to, to process the data. We didn't use any advanced method, and as I mentioned in my previous work, previous slide, my student did it. But we are going to update this part, okay? And the way I tried to extract, uh, when you have a lot of imaging measures, actually I didn't do this voxelized or like trackwise analysis, because at this stage I just run very simple summary structure, okay? And uh, traditionally in the field, people just run some uh, like a track average means. But what I did is just run PCA. Okay, just run the track the specific functional PCA to capture major variation within each wide matter tracks. Okay. We did see a lot of new signals when I tried to do that. Okay. And uh, besides that, we also did this resting a task function of MI. We applied the independent component analysis based on method to form 70, uh, 76 functional regions and generate uh, 1,701 1, functional connectivity traits in order to characterize major functional brand regions and uh, their connectivities. And uh, we try to map the 76 and ICA loads onto the AL template and, uh, and uh, the parcellation and predefined the functional networks. The reason we use ICA, we find that and uh, the, my collaborator Smith, Stephen Smith, he, ab, he is able to extract six major ICA-based tracks, uh, the features from the data. These data are quite, these uh, six measures are highly reproducible, okay? And that's the high, highest uh, kinds of uh, heritabilities, okay? And actually, even though we, we when you have these kinds of large data sets, the first thing you need to know how to process data. Okay, I just to tell you, told you uh, the number of the features that we extract from imaging data. Besides this kind of this kind of imaging processing, actually this field itself is called the brain imaging genetics is a learning problems. And you can read my the review papers by my friend, my two collaborators, Shen, uh, Shen and also Thompson, they published a paper in proceeding of the IEEE 2000, and there's a review papers on this topic. And uh, they clustered the problem into three categories, the learning problems in brain imaging genomics. The second one is by medical application considerations. The third one is statistical and machine learning considerations. Okay. And uh, besides that, actually we're also looking uh, at these methodological challenges associated with the imaging genetic data. And uh, actually we need a, first we need a data set, good data set. We need to know how to process the data. The third thing is we need to basically develop tools and a theory for brain imaging gen and genetics. Actually, these are four kinds of major problems we have been working on. One is multi, multiple biobank integration. You have to address the heterogeneities in global population. Okay, that's not a trivial problem to solve. Like uh, you have to deal with these kinds of the heterogeneity across the different populations. The second problem is basically the omics data integrations, and then you have the new technology by not biological pathways, how to integrate them together. The third type problem we have been working on is new computational tools, like the challenges of the dense signal in bi-bank um, scale, the 
database. One of my students, his whole dissertation is on this kind of topic. The last one, you basically need an advanced method for dense signal, like deep learning. And actually, I published a series of papers in the last 10 years on this topic um, by using the imaging genetic data. And but uh, right now, we are working on, on four major problems. One is association. We wanted to identify, replicate novel genetic factors associated with the brain function and structures. The second one is a causal inference and mediation analysis. That's super important. We want to analyze the genetic links among the brain structure functions, cognition, and the major di brain disorders. That's the past diagram I tried to link. Okay, that's the reason I even, I tried to build the whole diagram up. Even I don't have a data set to cover all these kinds of connections, but I still tried to integrate the different information together, try to build it up. The third one, I tried to do data integration. I integrated external genetics and genomics data to uncover the new biological insights, okay? The last one, we do prediction models. We perform the auto sample research predictions for brain disorders using genetics, genomics, and imaging data. The last part is related to uh, novel clinical findings. Okay. And uh, I, I, I'm, si I'm very similar to most of uh, statistician and biostatistics. I used to do a lot of methodology work, right? And actually in the last five years, I, I shifted my focus a little, okay? I spent more time on just the doing data analysis. Okay, that's the, all these third parties of our novel clinical findings. Uh, first thing is basically, based on our recent results, we built this kind of this big KP org, is a brain imaging gen genetics knowledge portal, okay? And uh, we aim to build the best knowledge database of neuroimaging genetics. You can visit our website and to link to, to download some of the like a summary statistics from our, our website. Okay. And besides that, and actually our portals consist of this GWAS Logs browser. And it's a searchable database for over 15 and um, 1593 plus your imaging traits across the four imaging modalities. Okay. And you, this is one of the typical examples, like the left hippocampus. And you see these kinds of mechanism. And also this is another example related to uh, the functional connectivity trait. And it's let 25 to load to 20. This is the amplitude trait. Okay, this is ICL trait. And uh, you also can download this kinds of the GWAS the summary statistics. And this full all set of the GWAS summary statistics has been made available to the public. And actually there are uh, over uh, 4,000 visitors so far. And this is uh, basically the, the results from our GWAS of the wide matter tracks. Okay, this, is the, this paper was published in Science uh, two months ago. And uh, this, uh, this, in these uh, studies, there are the two major part figures here. One is the overview. This is the left side is the, the, the Enigma DTI pipeline. How do we apply this pipeline to process our data? And actually we apply the same pipeline in the five different data sets, okay? And uh, the right side is re related to multi-stage, the designs in our GWAS analysis. For the UK by Bank, well, first we did it for, we used the phase one and phase two, okay? There's uh, about uh, 1,000, 1,700,000 of the samples, British ancestors, ancestries. And I also combine the results from the phase three. And we check the robustness of GWAS and then we combine all three together, okay? And also we do independent replication data set and then we find this good replication then we do the uh, meta-analysis of the GWAS of all the data sets, okay? And uh, we are able to observe uh, 100 online novel genetic regions associated with wide matter uh, microstructure. Well, why this paper could be published in science, I tell you the reason behind it. The key reason is this is the first the two papers in this field, okay, related to wide matter genetic architecture. Okay, There's in the history that nobody published anything related to that because we will never have this type of data to able to extract the uh, 
kinds of phenotype relate to white matter. That's the key reason behind it, because that's the first of the, this kind, you know, in the, in the science, okay? And actually, we published two papers. The first paper published in malaria cytology two years ago, okay? That's based on about 20,000 subjects. We only about identified 40 uh, low size. And actually, in this 40,000 of, um, when we, in this year, we, we used about 40,000 of subjects, we're able, able to identify 151 uh, low size. You'll see that sample size essentially for genetic discovery or trace with highly polygenic genetic architecture, okay? You wanna be see these kind of patterns in the, by using the any data set, okay? And also the white matter is highly heritable with the heritability on average is 45%, okay? And also we did the co-localization with the, the GBM, this is brain cancers, okay? And actually we found that for the 25 long genetic risk regions of the GBM, 11 associated with the white matter microstructures. Okay, that's also very important because that could be related to the uh, drug discoveries. And uh, also we uh, find that the genetic co-localizations among the vascular risk factors like obesity, diabetes, high blood pressures, and also white matter microstructures and the stroke. And we also show the stronger genetic correlation between white matter microstructure and also other um, kinds of small vessels stroke subtype. And actually there's the two panels, the left panels, then you see that the x-axis is a different kind of disease, okay? And also including this uh, intelligence, okay? A square frenia, like ASD and any stroke. And the, the, the white axis is basically the different uh, white matter uh, substructures, okay? And you see that basically a stronger genetic correlation with any stroke, MDD, intelligence, and the reaction time. We also identify the strong genetic correlations between white matter microstructures and the, the gray matter volumes of laboring the uh, regions, okay? We also did this kind of heritability enrichment analysis in brain cells. Okay, that's the one of the very important. And very, uh, we collaborate with some people from NYU. Basically, we are able to identify the basic brain cells, cell types, where the genetic variation leads to changes in wider matter connectivity. Okay. And actually, the, the growth, the cell type, like a neuron or non neuron, and wider matter is largely composed of the clear. Uh, cell type, like, like oligo, microglia, and ostracite. And the oligo allocation accounted for about 10% heritability, where only composed of 0.3% of genetic variation. And also, we did this uh, heritability enrichment analysis. We are finding the uh, clear cell enrichment was widely observed in white matter tracts, and most significant in the PCR, PLIC, and the GCC. And uh, we also did the DTI annotation enrichment. Had the ability of the 49 complex traits was significantly enriched in genetic region influenced white matter uh, microstructure, such as the stroke, schizophrenia, ADHD, bipolar, Alzheimer's disease, T2T, high blood pressure, and coronary artery disease. And uh, besides, and uh, actually this, the DTI work was done two years ago, okay? And then we get it published this year. And actually the last two years, I shift most of my focus to doing the function of my. The reason I'm doing that, I did that, is because function of my is very noisy data, okay? It's harder to get the a strong kinds of robust signals. We wanted to do something first, because that's the what it be. If we really can achieve something, that would make a big impact in the field. That's one of the, you know, why do I choose this one to do? At the beginning, I collaborate with sort of like uh, uh, Stephen Smith from Oxford, we just apply their pipeline, but we have a different focus. We focus on triple network model of psychopathology. Actually, these kinds of salience network play a critical role in dynamic switching between the central executive and default model network, okay? These three core networks, function networks, support effective, efficient coalition, highly related to major brain disorders like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, and major disorders, okay? 
we started from this most robust functional network when we do first started this project. And uh, we are able to see the highly high abilities for this triple network. And uh, you see the, the left panels for both the magnitude and functional connectivity. We see higher high abilities than the other functional network like motor and vision, okay? And also did this genetic of the functional brain network, we're able to identify that the, the low size influence of resting functional traits of intrinsic brain activities based on these uh, results. And uh, we also did uh, the co-localizations uh, between the brain function in the default model network and central executive network with Azama disease and the square framing. Okay. And uh, this in particular, like uh, this uh, Azama disease, APOE, that's the well-known genes related to brain uh, related uh, disorders. Okay. And uh, this one uh, on the chromosome uh, two, basically this region 2P16.1, it's a very well-known uh, kinds of uh, genes associated with spherophrenia. And actually, the, one of the interesting things are related to APOE genes. And the APOE genes has a stronger genetic relationship with the brain functions than the brain structures. And actually, the way first time to map this all together, you'll see that this is all the results from the white matters, gray matters, and this is a functional network. Okay? This result is quite a, very interesting. And also we did the co-localization at this specific region, 17Q21.31 regions. We find that these regions are highly related to the neuronal disorders and psychiatric disorder, education, cognitive abilities, psychological traits, and alcohol use disorders. And also did co-localization with these two kinds of regions associated with the sleep and the cognitions. And uh, we also did this uh, shared genetic influence between the functional connectivity or default model or central exactly no network and insulin volumes. Okay. We identify special co-localization between the regional brain volumes and their genetic correlated functional connectivity traits. And they also show these kinds of shared genetic influence between the functional connectivities and the structural connectivities. We identify genetic evidence on how distributed the functional network communicates across large distance. Okay. And these are the kinds of regions where the functional connectivity genetically related to the brain disorders and the intelligence. Okay, that's the basically the specific regions associated with ADHD. You can see all these uh, uh, sub-regions. And besides doing that, we also try to integrate the genetic uh, gene uh, expressions to PIS. Okay. What we did is, uh, is we combine the gene the expression informed the gene level of the PIS plus the GWAS PIS. We show that they're high, when we combine them together, they high, has higher prediction accuracy. You'll see that these figures, there are three different type of the dots inside. Okay, if you combine the two, three together, actually two together, you'll see the uh, higher kind of prediction accuracy. Okay. And uh, actually, the, we published a series of paper uh, from clinical science. All these are about data analysis. Okay, we suffer a lot when we started to write this uh, paper. But uh, actually, uh, unfortunately, we are uh, able to publish a series of papers since 2018 until now. We still have uh, some papers is ongoing. Okay, and uh, finally, you are able to. Uh, we shared hundreds of the associated genetic variation for over uh, around these 1600 your uh, imaging trace across the three different imaging types. Okay. And actually we are gonna release a new uh, larger portal related to heart. Okay. And actually the, the, the previous one is mainly on the neuro imaging larger patrols. And we are going to release this heart knowledge patrols pretty soon. Maybe this is already on the website, but uh, just, uh, and uh, we haven't submit, submit the paper yet, but it is uh, going to submit it in the next two weeks. And uh, these are ongoing uh, future directions we have been working on. To us, the most important thing is the causal relationship among the disease, brain structures and brain functionalities. The second one, we'll try to build optimal models 
for complex traits and disease prediction using imaging and genetic data. The third one is to compare and identify the best practical strategies and pipelines to process the different imaging modalities. That took us tons of time to work on. And also try to model the brain changes and the genetic effects across the lifespan. And that's what another problem I told the country is very important. I need to work on that. These are two problems are quite important these days. And I try to align and integrate the different imaging modalities, okay? And finally, I thank the funding agencies. And also, I want to thank all my students for their hard work for process the neural imaging data. Finally, I would like to acknowledge the UK by Bank. And they, without the UK by Bank data set, nothing is possible here. Thank you. Any questions? Hong Tu, can I ask a question? Here's Peter Song. Yeah, Peter. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, you gave a lot of the information, and one slide I'm particularly uh, interested in is the uh, the slides that you presented um, about the sleep uh, and some uh, association uh, findings related to sleep. Um, it's because I work a little bit on the sleep health. Um, so you like present that slice only like five or 10 seconds. And right, right, right. So I wonder how the sleep trade has been measured in this data. So what, what is the, the data, what kind of data you used and how sleep was measured here? I, I, I'm very interested in those genes. No, I think uh, we, we, we did this uh, we by using the other people's GWAS results to do this stuff. And, and I think uh, for this stuff, I think uh, we use chunk from UK by Bank, maybe on some other study, I don't remember exactly. But I think UK by Bank should have this type of data, collision and the sleep. You can yeah, so how, how the sleep is defined here? I'm, I'm just wondering. I, like... I don't know. I, I, I think the the, some people from Harvard, they basically run these GWAS for thousands of the phenotypes. They included this sleeper phenotype. Mm, but I I, maybe we maybe can kind of sleep sleep duration or uh, some, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Like, uh, cause there are many, many different ways to delete, uh, define sleep health, right? So, yeah. Uh, no, I, I mean, because I mean, we're working on some of this uh, epigenetics, I, I think the genes that you report here, 2Q14.2. Yeah, there's a well-known genes. Right, right. Well I, I think genes. that's something like we will probably look at the uh, CPG size around these two genes and see what happens. So that's why I want to know a little bit more details about the, how the, um, this, the sleep, uh, this kind of association that uh, has been discovered. Yeah. No, okay, I think thank you. we need to dig into the UK by Bank data set and see how do they define it. But we just uh, take the summary statistics from the sleeper GWAS. Uh, I think it may be mostly from, from the UK by Bank. And then, then the, we, we run into this uh, the colonization. On that. Okay. Yeah, maybe uh, we should go to UK back to really find out how sleep is defined there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know, I, you, yeah, I think that's a very great, great point because the sleep urinary related brain function. That's the of reason course. we are not able to find the, you know, related with like white matter kind mm. of this kind of problem, but only from the functional uh, kinds of brain functions. And actually, the sleep is kind of colorization. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. It's also open on chat as well. If you're going to type a question in chat or unmute yourself and ask a question. Hi, Hongdu. Uh, thanks for your very nice talk. So I have, I have a question regarding to your functional uh, network modeling for the identify the some genetic effect on that. So how, so you, you mentioned there's a, a very important functional network that they may have some interaction. 
involve like different mode uh, executive control. So how, how you actually define the, the, the phenotype based on those functional network? No, this is based on ICA component. We extract that from that. For this, the, you can read our papers. That's the, on the archive. We, we some propose an archive in last year. And we basically use the uh, uh, UK Bank, the this, this, this is the pipeline. And uh, basically, in particular, their ICX uh, Tango analysis to extract that. That's the, our first uh, function from my paper. Our second function of that paper, you also post it on by uh, archive, you can take a look at it. That one is different. But the second paper, we are only focused on the glacial 360. And we basically work on the specific region of interest and they try to interpret it from there. Because the ICAs, and uh, there's a lot of issues inside, even though you are able to identify six very strongly uh, repeatable and heritable um, signal, but it's still that six is difficult to interpret from the functional perspective. Brain function perspective. That's the reason we move back to the glass 360. That's another paper we didn't present it here, but it is, uh, you can find it uh, on an archive. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank just you. go to our website, you see, uh, identify that paper. Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. Now we have a follow up paper, maybe in two months, you, you, will, you will see that. We, okay. we really try to push forward on the brain function because the heritability is relatively low. And also the reproducibility is relatively low. We want to right. really solve that problem, okay? Because I think the, the current purpose of the pipeline has some issues. And also maybe just the data is too noisy. Right, okay. Yeah, thanks. So actually I had a follow up question. So what do you mean by a network? Do you observe the network or you, what's, what's, what's the construct no, of the network here? The no, I think that network. network already for in the brain image field, they define this network, you know, back at like a default mode, fire center, the central executive, that's the well-defined regions in the brain. Then basically they, they see a lot of like cool kinds of local kind of co-activation of these signal, these regions. And in the areas of neuroscience, they basically define this and based on a lot of the existing data, they, they, they summarize. So it's not the usual functional connectivity network network you get from the human connectome, that sort of no, thing. They did, they did, they, based on that, that. Okay. They use a lot of data, this in data analysis, they see a lot of these kinds of patterns. They summarize the different level of the time. So the object, that the statistical object of analysis is the network, right, that you, did I get that right? I'm just trying to parse out. No, this is a, this is a basically when we try to interpret the ICA, uh, related to the functional uh, measures. We find that if we put it, because we find that if we put this ICA component, this ICA component many uh, overlap with these three uh, networks, okay? So that we try to interpret our, all our findings back to these three networks, okay? That's the basically the key message from here. Because if you just interpret the ICA one, ICA two, right? Nobody care about, it, okay? Because they 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 say how does your what's the underlying neuroscience interpretation relate to your, all your signals, and as you do, then so the basically we see that all these ICA components is quite a overlap with these three major uh, function networks, okay? That's the most robust signal. Any other questions from the audience, the Zoom audience, or there you go. Uh, yeah, so uh, so I, I want to uh, ask a question about the uh, gene level PRS uh, you mentioned. Uh, so for the uh, for constructing the uh, gene level PRS. Uh, like, did you uh, use uh, the observed uh, gene uh, gene information, or you use the EQTL to predict the gene? No, you could tell. Oh, you could tell. Oh, I see. We we, we basically integrate with the GTA. I see. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Yeah. Uh, oh, and, and and actually another question is that uh, for the uh, gene level uh, PRS, uh, what method is used to select the genes? Yeah, I think uh, we apply the home use of pipeline to, to process the data. And uh, the, the guy from Yale, oh. he helped us to process part of the data. Of this. 
Yeah, I think that's the final report we did. And the first version we didn't use the uh, method, and then we updated all the time. Yeah. I see. Yeah, you can read our papers. They're published in Lecture Communication. Not this page. Oh, I see. Thanks. Any other questions? I say I had a, a generic question. Now, with, when you get into the imaging genetics world, right, you have such noisy data. And on top of that, both the sort of the responses and the covariates are sort of such high dimensional. How do you actually safeguard against multiplicity and false findings? No, for, the, for all these uh, clinical papers we did, we just do. We, we structure the summary statistics for all these imaging data. And then we apply the various regions of the collection to do that. And I think the, you know, uh, other, we didn't do this worker wise because I think that's the last step we would do. But I, at this stage, we just push all these clinical paper out and see how does the, the field react to that. That's the reason I didn't apply any of our met own method to do this stuff. I, I think if we have our own method, that the t-value is much more significant, but that's not my problem. I need the, the people from genetic community to you know, respect to this kind of just the thing of our method is quite good at this moment. I, I know this is a pretty noisy data. In particular, you have very noisy the, Imaging data. That's what be very tough question to solve. And, you know, and then for some of the imaging data, like if you do extract the image feature from the like uh, uh, TCGA, like CT like type of data, and you want to get a lot of signal. I think a part of the reason because you need a consistent imaging features. The second thing is you need a large sample size. Right. You know, at, at the beginning we do thousands of subjects. When we want to get any. Just to see some signals, they're not interesting scientifically from the, the people from neuroscience people. They don't care that much. I think you need to go get a good data. I'm not saying the imaging genetics is not important. That's the reason I keep a stick with this topic for a long time. Sometimes you know, when you have this uh, larger database available, maybe you can get some. Any further questions for Hongqiu? Going on to yeah, let's thank Hongqiu again. Thank you.